Welcome to the Sunday Morning Corner Man podcast presented by the Hot Cage Daily. I'm your host, John Franklin, and this week on our premiere episode of the Sunday Morning Corner Man podcast, I will discuss UFC 168 from a coach's perspective with John Krause from the MMA Lab in Glendale, Arizona. So without further ado, let's bring in our guest. He's the head trainer and jiu-jitsu coach at the Lab in Glendale, Arizona. He has trained such fighters as Hoist Gracie, Benson Henderson, John Moraga, Jamie Varner, Efren Escudero, and many others. He's John Krause. Coach, how are you? Good, what's up? No, I didn't train Hoist Gracie, but I did train with Hoist Gracie. Oh, yeah, yeah, I read that you had prepared him for a fight. So, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so here's my – I, I want to talk about UFC 168, biggest card of the year. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the Dustin Poirier-Diego Brandao fight. What I want to talk to you about with that is, from a fighter and a coach's perspective, talk to me about why it's so disrespectful for your opponent to miss weight. Oh, man, it's just hard. Like, it's difficult to cut weight. It's unpleasant. That's such a torturous prospect, you know, uh, prospect of doing it that when somebody doesn't do it, uh, you just you feel totally angry about it. So, you know, it's what you're hired to do. If you're in the UFC, you should be making weight. And uh, it's a, if you've ever been around a fighter cutting weight, it's miserable, and they're not happy. So if they have to do it and the other guy doesn't, it's, it's, I mean, it, that's what raises such harsh feelings. Do you think it gives the fighter that doesn't cut doesn't cut the weight any advantage? Uh, usually, when the guy misses weight, there's a high percentage that that guy loses the fight. It's very rare that if you miss weight, you win. So, honestly, I think it gives the other guy the advantage. You know, the mental thing of that you failed at your task. You know what I mean? That you didn't yeah. do your job. You know, deep inside, like that you didn't do the right thing, and it affects people. So, most of the time, people that miss weight don't win. It's all right. Let's, next, I want to move on to the Uriah Hall Chris Lieben fight. Um, I mean, you're a high level coach of MMA, uh, and you have a fighter. If you have a fighter who just doesn't show that killer instinct or doesn't fulfill his potential, sort of a guy that's great in the gym but can't translate it into the cage, how do you motivate a guy like that? I just got to keep practicing, man. I just got to do your uh, do your thing. But I don't I don't think Uriah had any problem the other night. If that's who you're talking about. Um, you know, his skill will shine through. His personality is going to, you know, it is what it is. You can't change people. so But you can help them try to get through it. But I didn't see any problem the other night. That was a pretty nice right hand that went through there and ended the fight. Yeah, and in the press conference, I think he's starting to make his peace with it. You know, he's not going to change himself. Like you said, he's not going to be maybe a guy that just goes for the kill. But he still wants to be a fighter and just has to do it on his terms. So I think that he may have, have yeah. it figured out. So I want to talk for a second about Eric Del Fiero over at Alliance MMA. The buzz about the MMA world is that it was his call to stop the Lieben fight, which if it's true, I commend him. So my question to you is, when you corner a guy and so much is riding on these fights, how can you possibly know when it's time for your head to override his heart? I've never been in that situation, but Eric's a great coach. Like He knows what he's doing. He's, he's, he's really good at his job. I think he just saw that Chris was disoriented, didn't quite know what was going on. And you're looking at people, especially somebody like Chris Levin, who's taken a lot of a lot of hard shots in his life. You're looking at his life after MMA. And uh, so I think it might be a little easier in that, in that you know, that example. But I think it would be super tough. I don't know. I'm glad I've never been there yet. You know, and that actually transitions perfectly to my next question. Um, have you ever had a fight, or if you haven't, if you were Chris Lieben's coach, how do you handle the subject of, you know, maybe enough is enough and it's time to hang him up and figure out what's next in life? Uh, and how far after a fight do you think those conversations should – should you wait to have those conversations? You should wait to have that for a while. Like, that's not a heat-of-the-moment conversation. I've known a lot of people that retire in the heat of the moment and then come back. You just relax. Like, you know, take it for what it's worth. Got caught with a punch. And really it's up to Chris and his family and the coaches that know him to make that call. I would never I would never sit on the sidelines and judge another guy and say, oh, it's time for him to go. You know, he's going to know. He needs to talk with his family. He needs to talk with his coaches that love and care for him and then make the decision from there. Well, I mean, but if you were in that position, do you do you know, have you been around a situation where you're like, I mean, is there a kind of a, like a, like a nudge you give him or a smooth way to kind of say, hey, listen, we're not bringing to the table what we used to, and maybe I don't want I don't want anything to happen to you. Or how do you, how would you approach it? Gosh, I don't know. That's tough. I I really haven't been there. I'm pretty new in the sport. You know, I've been doing it for about six eight years. So 
I haven't had any of those older guys that have taken beatings and, you know, not been able to perform like they have. So, you know, I suppose you, just like you said, you try to bring it up in supportive a manner as you can, you know, talk about their long-term health versus their short-term rewards. You know, always athletes want to continue in their career. They want to keep doing what they do, especially high-level athletes like that. And so it's always going to be, you know, in every sport, you always see people fighting against it and everybody has an opinion. Um, but, you know, you just try to be as supportive as you can and get them to consider long-term risks versus short-term rewards. All right, so let's move over to, to what's uh, near and dear to your heart, which is jiu-jitsu. Um, I want to talk about the miller Kamosh fight. I heard once that part of jiu-jitsu is a willingness to risk, risk position for a finish. That's what I saw with the Miller armbar. What did you see? Uh, I just think it was a small mistake by um, Kamoy's, and Jimmy's really good. That was nice to, you know, he goes to the Goga Plata setup, and Fabricio kind of leaned forward, and he swung right to the arm lock. We just actually practiced that yesterday, um, and it's pretty slick, you know. Um, for me, I like to take that arm out as soon as I can, whether it's Goga Plata or whatever. He left it in there for a second too long and paid the price, but you got to really, as opposed to getting on, Kamoy, so you got to give credit to Jimmy. That was a nice, slick setup. And, yeah, and he even said in the after fight that, uh, you know, the post-fight remarks that he just was patient with it, you know. And a lot of times you see an opening and you go for it, and, and it's really a credit to Miller's patience there, right? Yeah, well, he wasn't really risking anything. You know, the guy pulls out of the arm lock. That's pretty standard in, in jiu-jitsu and MMA. So it's, Jim's been there a thousand times. So he misses, you know, Kamoy pulls out of the arm lock. Who cares? You haven't lost anything. You're back to your guard again. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't think it was risky, but I thought it was awesome. I enjoyed it a lot. Okay, so let's move on to Travis Brown and Josh Barnett. Um, I got to talk to you about these Travis B Brown elbows. Um, I was talking to someone, and I said, to me it seems like Brown's build and his stature sort of allows him to get the optimal torque necessary to throw those elbows hard enough to knock out high-level guys. Is there any validity to that, or what do you see with that technique? Yeah, I feel like, you know, when you fight longer guys, their stuff comes from a different angle, you know, and he's able to create a little bit better angle with his length. So I think that's valid. You know, I don't know. I, I You know, I don't have any numbers to back up my opinion. But I heard him talk about it and him talk about how his length enables him to get good angles on those elbows. So I, I would think his stature helps a lot. Also, do you, I mean, do you think there's a counter to that? Is it, simp is it as simple as maybe keeping your head away from his power side, maybe going for the takedown with your head on the other side? <laughs> yeah, or? maybe shoot that head. Don't shoot that head outside double or single. Keep it on the inside. Yeah, I think maybe, that would be a maybe, start. Yeah, maybe some Greco-Roman wrestling, something. You know what I'm saying? Keeping it up or, or maybe some judo techniques. I don't know. It just seems like guys are walking into that. Josh Barnett probably didn't think in a million years he'd do it again. But Well, I and, know. you know, most people, if he feels comfortable, you dump that head outside single and you take the guy down. But, you know, with his length, he's able to resist it just long enough. But it definitely people will be prepared for it now going forward and have some answers. And just real quick to touch on Brown before we uh, depart, I was got, talking to somebody uh, on our regular podcast, and I, I, I like him for the fighter of the year, honestly, because he's had a huge year. Usually they don't give fighter of the year to a non-champion, but I don't know. L that aside, do you think that he's a special kind of breed of fighter in that he's a heavyweight and the guy throws flying knees, he's a former basketball player? He's going to be an interesting matchup for the guys in that division, isn't he? To tell the truth, I think he's great, but I, I don't – Kane is head and shoulders above everybody, in my opinion. I don't think anybody beats Kane. And I think Junior gives – I think Junior gives everybody else a hard time. So I got Kane and Junior – levels above everybody else so that's just my opinion for whatever that's worth and they've certainly earned it so okay let's talk about ronda rousey and misha tate so you are a jiu-jitsu coach in a major gym that trains champions and you got your black belt from none other than hoist gracie so i can't think of anybody who it's as good to pose this question to than you if sarah mcmahon who is ronda rousey's next opponent or kat zingano who's the number one contender sought your advice about ronda's armbar what would that advice be She goes from from everywhere, you know, and she does a great job of, she's so flexible, like you just got to, you can't put yourself down in that spot. The thing that Rhonda's strength is, she hits it off of her takedowns and her scrambles. It's not, it's not a traditional like jiu-jitsu thing where you set up and then you go for it, you know. So, you know, you just have to find somebody that's good at that, 
mimic the position and start to work on it. Um, tough to be in the clinch with her. I think the obvious, you know, game plan would be to try to stand up and stay at space because that's probably where Ronda's is the weakest right now. And uh, But she's working on that every day, you know, so she'll be better at that. If they ain't talk to me about it, <laughs> I don't know. We'd have to get together and study some film and find somebody that wiggled around like Ronda Rousey, you know, that was squirmy and great at arm locks and work on it from there. And she's, I mean, she's tough too in that, like, even a, a high-level wrestler would have problems with her because of that judo. So she all, she uses her judo as a takedown defense. Yeah, it's nice to see judo back, you know, because really not too many people effectively employ judo. Even some of the guys that are good at judo are more like, it's more like a Greco-Roman kind of judo, you know. And uh, Rana, like, since Carol Parisian was doing his thing, that's the first time we, the first time I've seen it used so effectively. So yeah, it's awesome. You know, wrestling should those high level of people. It will be an interesting style matchup for sure. Okay, so in your opinion, is this pretty much going to be the story in all Ronda Rousey's fights until the UFC gets Cyborg Santos into that uh, promotion, or do any of the girls currently on the roster you feel like stand a chance against them? Um, I like Sarah McMahon. Um, I saw her fight Shayna Baszler live at Invicta. Um, she had some trouble with Shayna, so I worry just seasoning wise. You know, Ronda's getting better and better, and she has a, a nice mean streak, which you like to see in fighters. And she thinks she's the best, and that confidence will help a lot. So, But I like Sarah McMahon. And, you know, pedigree-wise, she has everything that you need. And now it's just a matter of putting it all together and feeling like you you can beat the, the girl. I don't really think Misha felt like she could win that fight. And, um, you know, it, it it's my opinion. What do I know? But, like, you walk in there with somebody and you can sometimes tell the other person just looking at them like, holy crap, this is going to be tough. So if Sarah can go in there with, you know, with her credentials in her mind right, I think she has a good chance. And the interesting thing is that Ronda's starting to move into, as I'm going to transition to Anderson Silva here, she's starting to move into that territory in a sense. Obviously, she doesn't have Anderson's credentials, but people are going into fights with her, seeming like, like getting out of the first round some sort of a moral victory or getting her back. I don't know that anybody goes in there fully, like you said, with their head on their shoulders, prepared to beat her. And that's that's a huge advantage that you have walking into a fight. You know, it's kind of like Mike Tyson in his heyday when people are going in there. Frank Bruno's doing the sign of the cross 15 times. Yeah. And you're like, man, this guy's in for a, a quick night if he doesn't get his head on right. And it was a quick night, you know. Yeah. So transitioning to Anderson. First, let me get your thoughts um, on his injury, uh, how it will affect fighters' willingness to kick the legs and uh, how it'll affect Anderson moving forward. I don't know that it'll affect him. It sucks, but it's a broken leg. I mean, the kid did it worse in the NBA last year. I don't know if you've seen that film, but yeah. uh, he did the same thing. Landed wrong. Bone was sticking out of the thing like it was gruesome, and he's playing. So, you know, the kid's 24, and he's not 40, but at the same time, it looks terrible. It was horrible. You feel horrible for the guy, but it's just it's a broken leg. And uh, as long as there's not nerve damage or something's ripped up terribly in there, he should be able to heal and come back. And that guy's, you know, he's been around. He's strong enough mentally to do whatever he wants to do. So next I want to talk to you about Chris Weidman's predicament because you were in a similar one uh, with Benson following the Frankie Edgar fights. You won them, yet the public felt that Frankie won at least one. So how do you deal with not getting the full recognition publicly for your efforts? I don't care. Uh, I think Chris Weidman, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, he dominated every second of every fight, of both those fights. He didn't lose any of them. So the people that say that are ridiculous, first of all. And it's a different situation for Benson and Frankie because their fights, you know, the fights were close and people have their opinions in those close fights and sometimes, you know, win those and sometimes you lose those. But for Weidman, those fights weren't close. They weren't close. Yeah, and that's true. And even, Ch well, Chael Sonnen, when he was comparing Anderson and uh, John Jones, he said John Jones was head and shoulders above, and the, excuse, and the thing that he said was kind of similar to what you said. You know, Chell was never in the Jones fight for a second, and you're right. I mean, Anderson, I mean, he had moments in the Weidman fights, but they were very, very brief, and you never really felt like yeah. Weidman was in trouble. He was frustrated, but I don't think he was ever in yeah, trouble. I, no, he was fine. I, I, yeah. Weidman was fine. I don't think he was frustrated either. I think he was fine. Yeah. That kid's great, man. Like, people don't understand how good he is. I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, and, and, you know, whatever Anderson is, greatest of all time. But Weidman won every every round, every minute of those fights. Yeah. 
I mean, I think sucks the way it, lost, the, the, it ended. You hate to see that. That's terrible. Like terrible for Anderson, terrible for Chris, terrible. But it doesn't change the fact that the six minutes before that were a domination. That's true. Yeah, I mean that kid's got a great head on his shoulders, man. He, it, it, I think that there's a chance that he could he could really have a good reign. Uh, okay, so yeah, well, maybe and maybe maybe somebody beats him in the next fight, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the Anderson fights. The Anderson fights are what they were, and in my opinion, he didn't lose any of it. So, you know, if he loses to Vitor, does that say anything? No, I don't think it reflects at all. You know, Vitor's a totally different opponent or whoever they fight next. That's going to be decided by those guys. But as far as the Anderson fights, I, I don't think there's – the people that are saying there's a question, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't get that at all. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I mean, you've kind of done this anyway, but – so uh, I was going to ask you to assess Chris Weidman – so the question was if you felt if you saw enough in both fights to feel comfortable that a he's better than Anderson Silva right now and b that he's at the top of that division. I mean he's clearly at the top of that division, right? I mean Vitor's right there, but he's the cream of the crop at 85. I mean, he's legit. He beat the best fighter of all time twice. Yeah, that's true. Not not just beat him, but finished him. And you know, say Anderson didn't break his leg, Chris was going to finish him. It was happening. It was coming. So. He beat the guy twice. The best guy ever. He beat him twice. How can you even have any doubts about it? That's my opinion. All right, Coach. I'll get you out of here on this one. Um, just talk to me about some of your expectations for the lab uh, in 2014. Actually, my, I just talked to my team about that. My resolution for us is to be better prepared than anybody, to make sure that we work hard and come to every fight ready to give our hearts. And if we do that, we're going to do just fine. All right, there you have it, fans. He's John Crouch. He's the jiu-jitsu trainer over at the lab in Glendale, Arizona, trainer of champions. Uh, Coach, I appreciate your time, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, brother. Have a good day.